Boom, watch fam. What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. And I'm Anna, I do content. <laughs> I love that intro. Uh, I am wearing a Rolex, uh, a Datejust reference, 1601-1577. You made one. an amazing video about this watch. We made an amazing video oh, about this watch. Thank you, what are you wearing, Anna? I am wearing an incredible day date. It is a white gold uh, presidential bracelet in case and a black dial. It's beautiful, I love wearing it. It's incredible, it feels yeah. great. We're super Rolex yeah. today. Anyway, uh, today we're sitting down, we're gonna answer like, 10 questions yeah. we asked you guys on an Instagram live. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you don't already follow us on Instagram and you would like to ask questions uh, to us next time, go ahead and follow us at Theo and Harris. So we're gonna do like 10 questions about yeah. um, the, the you know, new watch releases, the vintage watch market, kind of current events, all things watch related. Yep. So let's get into it. Let's Boom. do it. Uh, will the Milgauss ever be a classic or appreciate in value? I'll let you answer that. Um, no, I think that the Milgauss will appreciate from where it is. I think the Milgauss is kind of cheap right now. Um, hmm. Yeah, the, the, the pre-owned examples, uh, they're pretty low. Uh, they're disproportionately lower than other Rolex models. Mm -hmm. um, specifically because Rolex sports models are so hot right now. And they're interesting, you know, uh, whether you like them or not, you have yeah. to say that they are, you know, distinct in, in, mm -hmm. in color, you know. The problem, I think, with the Milgauss, um, from like a, as the decades go on, yeah. a lot of the surfaces are polished, so it doesn't really age that well. Like, it's not like a vintage sub where um, it has a tritium patina, the mm -hmm. eggshell turns to custard, which is beautiful. Um, right. It's also not like the sub in the sense that, you know, the brushed metal, you know, um, I don't want to say dings, but t tarnishes, ages, you know what I mean? Yeah, like it wears this, nicely. This just gets scratched. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like super polished surfaces, they just scratch. Um, it's one of the problems with the Royal Oak as well um, mm. on its, you know, polished surfaces. Anyway, um, that's a problem for it. Next question. Cool. Um, what's your favorite Rolex bracelet? My favorite Rolex bracelet, and this is a newfound, a deep, deep passion, yep. is the presidential bracelet. I think that it is the perfect balance of total versatility and comfort. Mm -hmm. And I think that it wears really sturdy, which for me actually like matters. Mm -hmm. like, I really like when it throws heft on my wrist, yep. but I don't like when it's too sporty, which I feel the oyster is at times. So for me, the presidential is perfect, and I mean, you love the it. Class, I mean. You've been alternating between two black dial presidents for the last Yeah, <laughs> for the last three weeks. Yeah, put some photos. <laughs> These watches are They're sick. They're beautiful. Um, what about you? I'm a strap guy, number one. I, I wear mm. Jean Rousseau straps available in the Fiona Harris watch shop. I love our new Rover strap. I love our Quint. I love the Type oh, yeah. 1. It's the only strap I'm wearing right now. Mm -hmm. Amazing straps. Beautiful. That's what I do. That being said, I can appreciate a great bracelet. I, historically, I go president. If you didn't just say president, I might have said president. Mm -hmm. But I stole it. No BS. I just got in well, the Theo and Harris shop uh, listing on Monday a um, 1963 Rolex GMT 1675 um, gilt dial pointed crown guards. It's crazy watch. Freaking gorgeous. And it has a rivet oyster bracelet. Now the reason I love the rivet oyster bracelet, well, there's, there's two reasons. One, it's expandable, so it stretches, which is so That's cool. Really cool. I love that it has a spring system, yeah. so the bracelet itself actually does stretch. Um, number two, uh, and I love this about the Royal Oak, this is what I love about the Royal Oak, is it looks substantial from there, mm -hmm. like from the outside, but really it's super thin. The bracelets are really thin. Um, it's the same thing I love about the Speedmaster in the shop right now. Um, I love those brick bracelets. I love bracelets mm -hmm. that look tough, but really are very delicate. Yeah. It's just a beautiful, like, harmonious it's design. It's like an oxymoron, like it's I cool. I love it, I love it. Next. Yeah. Thoughts on purchasing a Tudor to satisfy the Rolex itch or just wait? So I think that if you are into looking at your wrist and seeing Rolex, mm -hmm. like if you know for whatever reason, like you need to have a Rolex. It's very valid. Buy a Rolex, like yeah. I get it. However, if you're looking for something that has substantial build from a company with great history, that's really well made, yep. that has a specific design and serves a specific function in your collection right. or is the first one that you're starting with, right. then I think Tudor absolutely scratches that itch and for a price that is smaller. So I think that it, they have fantastic designs and they have great watches. Right. Specifically, if you're looking vintage or pre-owned, I think there are a crazy amount of options if you're if you want to satisfy a Rolex edge, and technically it is Rolex. Agreed. If you want X, Y is never going to make you happy. Right. You know, like my dad. Right. My dad wanted a Rolex GMT since he was like twelve. Right. It is you know as soon as he knew what a Rolex was, the GMT like had his eye. 
Yeah. Right? That's so cool. He wanted a, he wanted a Rolex. Mm-hmm. Like, period, end. It meant something. It meant uh, an achievement. It meant being a place in life, which yeah. is so much of what Rolex means to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Tudor GMT wouldn't have done it for him. Yeah. He and would I get have that. always felt like a compromise. Uh, and he couldn't afford the Rolex, and he couldn't afford the Tudor either. You know, so, you know, it was... <laughs> while it, we're spending money we don't have. Right. He, right. While we're spending money we don't have, <laughs> I'd rather wait till I'm 40 and get yeah. the watch that tortures me than buy yeah. the uh, the other one earlier, even if it's basically just as good. Even if the Tudor's just as good. That's, <clears> you know, <throat> just don't settle. That being said, the Tudor GMT, or Tudor, is not settling. Right? right, that watch is a great watch. I mean, mm-hmm. re- re- reliable, bigger. If if your wrist is bigger, it's actually maybe better for you. Um, so it's great. But no, don't don't settle. Like try not to settle in general. Yes. Next. Okay, real quick, we're gonna pause the Q and A to make two announcements. Christian, number one. Super easy announcement. I would just like to uh, shout out Mario Femolaro. He's a TNH fan, watch geek, and friend of the company. And he is uh, raising money this month um, for breast cancer awareness through Real Men Wear Pink. Um, if breast cancer has ever affected anyone that you know, um, or if you're just feeling which, particularly, yes. which of course it has, uh, or if you're just feeling charitable today, uh, the link is in the description. It's a great cause, guys. You know, instead of like doing like a big, like this video is sponsored. I'm just like, guys, we did, they, you know, just we everyone donate knows some been money to cancer month. awareness. So do that, like if you can, now. Link below. So the second announcement is if you're gonna be in New York City today, come to the Oculus to the London Jewelers Boutique. They're doing their first annual watch fair in the Oculus, yeah. and we're gonna be there basically all day. So come like talk watches. If you want to hang out with you know Anna and I, uh, like, you know, come come hang out. Yeah. Come hang out at Oculus. All right, back to the video. Do you see any increase in value of the Vacheron Constantin overseas because the Nautilus and Royal Oak have been uh, getting so astronomically high? Good question. Yes, I think that the uh, VC overseas will inevitably rise. I don't know when. I think it's overdue for a rise. Mm. You know, those first generation, second generation overseas, a watch that was, I think, introduced in like the 90s because the 222 ran until late 80s, I think. I have to double check. But the 222 ran for a while, um, and then there was a gap, and then the overseas was introduced. I think that those watches, under $10,000 for time only, under $13,000 for chronograph, they're undervalued. I don't understand why. It mm. makes no sense. There are so many other brands that are doubling down and introducing still sports watches because of the craze, and yet the VCs haven't skyrocketed yet. Maybe because it doesn't get enough press? That yeah. could be why. Um, I, it could be for a host of reasons. I just don't really know why. But you think they will? I think they will. Yeah, it's, it's it's bound to happen. It's inevitable. It's just when. Like I think it should have happened a year ago. So buy up those VCs. Right. I mean, yeah, you could buy them up or, or don't. I mean, do whatever you want. If you love it, then buy it. Um, yeah. I have no horse in the race. Um, I don't have a stash of thirty of them. I wish I did. Um, so that, that's that's the answer. On a second note, um, you know, this conversation is extremely relevant in the in the light of, of the introduction of, of Chopard's, you know, Alpina Eagle, um, Alpina Screaming Eagle, Alpina Alpina Eagle. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Screaming Eagle. Uh, Alpine kind of Eagle. Alpine thinking. Eagle. That's what it is. Um, I have a couple thoughts on that. So, and I'll give me like ninety seconds, and I'll be in and out of this. On conversation. the clock, starting on now. the clock. Chopard just released this watch, steel sports watch, twelve thousand um, dollars, and a couple of things happened that I want to talk about. One. It's a new marketing strategy and I hate it. Um, it's a marketing strategy that, of course, traditionally taps the big <clears throat> publications. Of course, big watch publications, that's their job to talk about this stuff. And they're always going to be favorable, right? Big watch publications are paid to be favorable. It's unacceptable when they lie, but they're always going to be favorable. And even if there's not a cash exchange, you're friends with the CEO of the company. Mm-hmm. Like you have dinner together, so no one really wants to crap all over their product. Some will, most won't. We can live with that. But as watch enthusiasts who have been uh, in this hobby since like the infancy of Instagram, it hurts to see the change of the Instagram community now. Because it, what it used to be was enthusiasts being the consumers, and then the content creators, the big blogs. And we all had dialogue and understood and we were okay with that, right? That's fine. But now, brands have figured out a way through influencers to not even always pay influencers, but to just like give them special treatment, to invite them to a dinner at their boutique, to make them feel special, to ask them to take some photos and to wear the watch for a week, and then ultimately release, release their opinion. 
the funny thing is, like I said before, they're usually not even being paid because influencers are looked at so low on the marketing totem pole. Plus, it's not really their job. Like usually these influencers, right. like they do other things. A lot of them have money on their own. This isn't their gig. Um, and it feels great to be treated special, right? It feels yeah. great to be given early access. It feels great when a boutique manager calls you and invites you to a launch dinner. Yeah, of course, it yeah. makes you feel special, right? But it's allowed these brands to creep into uh, more honest discussion. And I hate that. Mm -hmm. I hate that people are now giving very favorable, non-critical at all opinions on the community level. It bothers me. And this Chopard release is a great example of the danger of that. I don't know if it was a successful launch. I can't speak to that. But I can speak to, you know, how many of these influencers were speaking from all different parts of the world, mm. speaking positively um, about, about this release that has plenty of critical points. The watch is a Frankenstein. It's a $12,000 well-made but unoriginal watch. I think that originality should be demanded at that price point. Originally designed. Yep. And it, it drives me bananas that this $12,000 watch, which will inevitably trade for six to $8,000 on the Chrono 24, okay, is being so um, admired and so looked at as if it wasn't a design Frankenstein. The original watch, the Saint Moritz, the, the original Alpina Eagle, was a ripoff of, of, of you know, obviously Genta and, and Piaget. Right? This one is a ripoff of um, the, the original Hublot, the MDM Geneve, and the Nautilus. Like, this is two generations of pulling from other people and putting something together. Again, not a bad watch. Great, right. great movement. Apparently a really comfy bracelet, from what I can tell from the internet. Really good proportions. Um, the, the, the dials are gorgeous. I've seen a thousand photos. Great job, Chopard, on all of that. But at the end of the day, no matter how good you do at it, so twelve thousand dollar Frankenstein of design, like, and you're and you're putting lipstick on it, like, right. stop. Would you consider the Apple Watch being part of your collection? You say um, I actually um, thought about it for a millisecond at some point in like the second or third iteration of the Apple Watch because because I'm so interconnected on all my devices, which you absolutely are not. Um, it, it was interesting to me to you know explore the idea of just increasing my workflow making things a little faster or whatever by having an Apple Watch. However, because I'm also interested in wearing nice watches and I feel very connected to my pole router, to specific watches in the shop that I connect to. <laughs> usually day dates. Usually day dates. Um, relinquishing the space on my wrist to an Apple Watch for like a slight potential increase in workflow did not seem yeah. worth it. It just wasn't worth it to me, so that's why I ultimately would not have an Apple Watch. And this is coming from a girl who four years ago didn't understand why watches cost more than $100. It was like, literally, what do you mean? I love it. I bought mine from Urban Outfitters. <laughs> <laughs> that watch was the worst. It was I adorable. It was watch a little baby. So bad. Um, uh, I agree with you. I think it's an ugly thing. Let's stop yeah. there. I would never actually use it. Um, right. But I forget you that. Would literally never even set it up. You wouldn't know how to do no, it. No, no. Put that aside. <laughs> I think it's just ugly. I don't think it looks good on guys. I think it yeah. looks bad on girls. It doesn't, it just doesn't flow with anyone's wrist at all. I've never seen it like integrate well mm -hmm. into someone's wardrobe. I've seen Fair. beautiful women, right? Working in, in, in the city, at coffee shops, whatever. Beautiful women. And I look and I'm like, wow, they're so well put together, their hair, everything's great. Right. Then I see this like tumor, like this this black tumor <laughs> on their wrist. I'm like, oh my god. Oh my god. First thing we're doing is taking that thing off. <laughs> you know. Anyway. Are you optimistic about the current vintage market? I would answer that. Um, super good question. There's a long answer and there's a short answer. The short answer, let's focus, Christian. Um, it depends on, you know, the vintage market is not a real thing, right? It's micro markets, right? There are individual little markets. There's the GMT yeah. market, the Daytona market, the Day Date market. <clears throat> I think that the Day Date market is undervalued. I think that it's ridiculous. You can get a rare variant, yeah. not the rarest, but a rare Day Date, like let's say like a second tier Day Date for $15,000. A lot of money, not a lot of money when it comes Congrats. to buying the second tier of a particular model in Rolex. Um, the best day dates are Stella's, those are more expensive, but still. Mm -hmm. um, GMT, the same. The best GMTs, 6542 Pepsi, under $100,000, right? Yep. How, you know, the, it's the best 
of a Rolex vintage collectible sports watch in steel. Crazy. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. That same category in Daytona or in Submariner is in the millions. Uh, and I don't think that the Submariner is 10 times or 12 times or 15 times better or more collectible than the GMT. Right. So I think the difference is too large. Uh, that being said, there are markets that are overvalued. Mm -hmm. I think that four digit Daytonas are overvalued. Great watches. I totally get the value at 50,000. I even get it at, at 60 and that's a stretch. But 80, 90, 100 for mm -hmm. average models, too much. Um, for the best models, fine. I, I can even get the best Daytonas in the hundreds. You know, 100, 200, 300. But for average, at like 85, and I, I think it's not sustainable. What do you think of the Bark presidential bracelet? Um, I think it's cool. I think if you can rock it, I think there's there's a specific kind of style and like person that can wear it probably. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's cool. I don't think I would ever buy one or, or wear one, but I think that um, if, if like you're already into that and like you want something that's like, oh wow, like that's that. Yeah. good for you like then you know it's a cool thing that's a little more subtle ish sort of I guess I think it's something that you wear ironically well like, I think that if you know you can wear that ironically right well. I could wear it ironically well John Mayer <laughs> could wear it ironically well Zac Efron if he's a watch guy I you know what I mean like, yeah, you know what I mean like uh, um, Adam Levine you're, let me just okay you're just you're pairing yourself with John Mayer or Zac Efron and Adam Levine let's just, let's just put that out there okay uh, point well taken uh, th my point is that, uh, that people who do not fit the style stereotype of bark day date right. would wear it well um, if you fit the stereotype meaning um, if you talk like like you're like kind of a it's jerk like, yeah, like you, you know what I mean like we're we gonna we're we gonna go later we're we gonna go play the slots later <laughs> like if you know what I mean like this place is this place is dead <laughs> if you're that kind of guy then I, I think that the, the, the bark Daytona the, the bark day date looks like oh my god it's that guy like <laughs> honey can we leave <laughs> like uh, he's getting loud <laughs> like he's super crude like can we go that's a ridiculous answer to, to a simple question yeah um, but it can be too that's much true. in the in some context and it can be very <clears throat> tasteful in another context cool next question are box and papers worth the premium and we actually We'll give a short answer now, but we actually have a full video explaining box and papers, what it means, blah, blah, which you can write there and it'll be linked below. Um, no, I don't think so. A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. I think that's a common message um, within the world of complex industries, right? Um, people, mm -hmm. and I, what do I mean? I mean, um, when you're in industries that have a lot of variables, right? Uh, vintage watches, art, uh, cars, right? There's so much to know, mm -hmm. right? And people like dealers, only know this much, <clears throat> sure. right? But the average person knows this much, yeah. right? And that person, um, scared by how much there is to know, yeah. learns one tidbit or two tidbits and tries to scale this mountain with those tidbits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. One of the things that dealers really understand is how much we don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. there's so much, uh, you know, you'll always catch me, if someone, in a business meeting, if someone says a reference that I don't know, I say, no, I, don't, I just don't know what that is. I just don't know what that is. You don't sit there and yeah. pretend to know, right. which is something that you do when you feel, when you feel inadequate, uh, when you feel, you know, lesser, you try to pretend, not something that we do. It's too complex. You can't know everything. Yeah. Right? Uh, the first time that I heard someone that I look at as a, you know, it was John Goldberg. Right? The first time that I ever heard this person who's looked at as a god in this industry, an all-knowing legend, say, uh, no, I never heard of it. I said, that's what we, everyone should do that. We should all do that when we don't <laughs> yeah. know because he did it. And if he did it, that means he's smart. I was like 19, you know? Uh, and that's, yeah. that's the answer. So what do I mean? I mean, box and papers <clears throat> is, uh, it can be valuable. Right, mm -hmm. um, box and papers in super collectible watches um, makes it, you know, at, at that point there is no logic. Right, it can add hundreds of thousands of dollars in value, okay. but for everything else, for you know, for other watches, I think that it's a waste of money. And I think that when people look at it as, as a, you know, as a barrier to sale, meaning I need box and papers or for this original. 16700 uh, to feel safe, you're crazy mm -hmm. because one. Papers can be faked easier than a watch, number one. And number two, you're about to pay, pay a significant premium for something that, you know, is the first thing to burst when if the market bursts. Right. Right? If you're if you're gonna you know buy a Daytona, uh, you know, a vintage Daytona, a four digit Daytona, uh, the box and paper premium could easily be ten or twelve thousand dollars. And that's one of the first things people are gonna stop giving a shit about, uh, you know, if if that market does collapse, yeah. which for argument's sake, let's say it does. So I say I say stay away. 
it's not, I'd rather I'd rather put that money toward the next watch. Yeah. You know. So you're already here first. Thoughts on the ten watch collection for the Elon Zona 25th anniversary. Um, I'm not a big fan. I don't think that Longa introduced anything new, right? I think they just introduced new, like, color versions, which was, like, a white and blue variation for existing watches. So, not really a fan. Longa's a huge innovator. I hear they're making a sports watch. It's going to be crazy. Um, Longa's a huge innovator. I don't necessarily think that they celebrated the 25-year anniversary very well. Is 25 years a monumental anniversary? Maybe not. Maybe that maybe right. fifty they'll do really well. Mm-hmm. I think that Paddock celebrating their their anniversaries they do really well. Paddock's hundred and fiftieth anniversary they released the Jump Hour reference. I forget the reference thirty six ninety something. I here's know. a photo. No, uh, here's a photo. That was cool. It was a new reference, yeah. and it's the reference specifically <clears throat> to celebrate the hundred and fifth anniversary. Very cool. And then once that anniversary is done, the watch is done. That's cool. That's how you do it. That's cool. But that I, I, I like. get the twenty fifth is maybe like. Yeah, maybe twenty fifth isn't that big. One hundred and fifty is huge. But then again, I still think that you almost like devalue the like the impact of like celebration watches when you. This is like a, we've seen this a lot with like Tudor, and you, we always have the same criticism of like mm-hmm. that's not a big change. Like this isn't a big enough change mm-hmm. to make a huge deal about. Yeah. So, but this isn't standard for Elling Zone, so like maybe it's just was like yeah. yeah well, why not give them? Maybe people really wanted that. Maybe yeah. that they, you know I don't know. Underwhelmed. So yeah. Any advice for young entrepreneurs starting a business? You, uh, you didn't start it, but you were there from so. day one, and you were there right. from like the thirty-sixth hour. So yeah, so I didn't start this company, but I think that a big thing for us and what determined our ability to um, change as this market has been changing because it has so quickly is to be okay with making mistakes, but at the same time trusting your gut and trusting your direction. So mm-hmm. what you you're, you you know where your goal is, mm-hmm. right, and you. You're, you're, you're constantly trying to reach that, but like, don't be afraid if the thing that you've invested like six months into like doesn't work. Like, you mm-hmm. gotta deal with it and then move on and try something else. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that people can, if you're alone and you have, because a lot of times it was like you, you felt like, oh my God, it's just me against the world. Like, what if this isn't right? But if you start like pumping your ego into it to make yourself feel safer and feel better, then those losses are gonna feel a lot worse. So as long as you're able to like, trust that you know where you're going and people make mistakes like and you can just redo it and that's what we've done with the channel a million times and that's what we've done with inventory and there's you know you just have to be able to bounce back and i think that we've done that absolutely every every aspect of this business has been overhauled uh 15 times since the yeah. day we started right the youtube channel is not it, it's not even a cousin of, of what started started as or mm-hmm. was three months ago um you make mistakes you know you you, you learn you, yeah like you said we always knew what Theo and Harris would be. We knew the end, um, but it's a matter of how you get there. And, mm-hmm. and we'd love to go like this, but it doesn't work that way. Right. Uh, I would love to even go like this, and yeah. You know, but instead, the reality is, you <laughs> just go like this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and th- th- that is what it is. The sad yeah. reality is that most businesses um, don't get there. Right? Most businesses mm-hmm. don't actually reach their end goal, or, or they or they don't get close. That's the reality. Mm-hmm. And and my answer to the question is is. Uh, I think, I think Gary Vaynerchuk calls it auditing, um, or oh, that's mm. either that or L. Ron Hubbard. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Really. But it sounds, <laughs> but it sounds like L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, the bottom line is, um, it's constantly um, looking, you know, within and saying, is this working? Mm. Right. Put, put my ego aside. Is this effort bearing fruit? Mm-hmm. Right. And are they the fruit that I want? Right? Exactly. Many times, you know, uh, I've made thousands of dollars doing something and said, wait, I'm making thousands of dollars, but you're sacrificing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? And that's just that's just the reality of the situation. I don't mean today or tomorrow, but you mean the grand scheme. Yeah. Oh, sacrificing millions in certain people's cases, right? Yeah. So that's um that's my answer mm-hmm. is constantly ask yourself, well when I say constantly, you know, once a week, once a month, be open. Be open to when it comes naturally mm-hmm. and say, is this working? Because if it isn't, I gotta change something now. Mm-hmm. And I wish I changed it two months ago, right. but I didn't. So stop crying about mm-hmm. it and change it now. That's my answer. All right, that's it. Thank you guys for sending in your questions and make sure you follow us on Instagram to be part of the next Q&A that we do. Thank you guys so much for watching. <clears throat> Anna and I are doing this like every other week now or every like, two and a half weeks. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a blast. Go ahead and subscribe to our channel at Theo and Harris if you love watches. Um, And like this video if you did like it. I will see you all like tomorrow or something. Boom, watch fair. Ready? Let's got this. Let's got this. That's good. Good start. Oh, man. What is up? Wait, 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 wait.
Ready? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about my guy. Oh. Sorry. I start to focus on you yelling at me, and now. You ready to give this answer? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Oh, big public word. Public word. Public word. Talk about sex, baby. baby. I texted him yesterday. Where you? were we? Change your mind. Change your like a girl changes clothes. Yeah, yeah. I'll answer quickly this time. Oh, Ready? Go. Thank God's help. <laughs> Yeah. I was really ready to pitch this one to you. <laughs> okay, um, let's start over. Wake her up. <laughs> Woo! Ready? Okay, do, uh, bleh. Okay, stop. As well as the unique exposure to the elements that each watch faces over its lifetime, no two tritium watches are exactly the same. So, let's meet the Rollies. First, 